So, welcome to programming languages. Today we will just do a few elementary concepts, broad classifications of programming languages uh, without going into too much detail. Um, so, this is the first lecture and um, so let us let us just look at the notion of a program or a programming language. So, um, we are all familiar with the notion of a machine, a computer and uh, it has what, what one would call a bare machine has just a piece of hardware. Uh, it is usually in binary, uh, well you can just think of it as a whole lot of switches connected with complicated circuitry. Um, the memory, the arithmetic unit, all of them consist of switches activated one way or the other and uh, even in a and it and it, and you can see it is going to be a big problem just operating the uh, those millions and millions of switches. Yeah. So, what you have is a language which just consists of binary strings. So, in a bare machine what you would just have is a language consisting of binary strings. And so, these binary strings uh, in what is known as uh, the von Neumann architecture, uh, which is called the stored program concept, right. Both data and instructions have the same format. And uh, uh, so, everything is a binary string and depending upon how you look at it, it is it's either a data item or an instruction to execute something. Right. So, so that is the von Neumann concept. So, which means that programming such a machine uh, basically requires you to be able to uh, interpret certain sequences of bits either as data or as instructions. And if they are instructions to I do not know manipulate some registers, maybe load into memory, store uh, load from memory, store into memory or perform some arithmetic operation or some logical operation and so on and so forth. Right. So, in general even that language what we might call the machine language can be called a programming language. Because let us take a very general view. Uh, what is a programming language? A programming language is just some notation for describing algorithms and data. So, in general we could consider a programming language uh, to give you a means of representing algorithms and data structures. And uh, when you have a representation of algorithms and data structures, presumably you are able to perform your manipulations. Yeah. So, the first uh, the first thing about a bare machine is that if you are going to use the machine language itself, then there is really no fundamental difference between the algorithm and the data, which means a sequence of instructions could just as well be regarded as data items. A sequence of data items provided they have some circuitry could also be executed as an algorithm. I mean God forbid what might actually happen, but I mean in, in principle you could execute even a sequence of data items as instructions by interpreting it suitably. Right. So, the first distinction that we would like to draw is between what constitutes a data item and what constitutes a part an instruction. Okay, so, there are various, uh, so let us, but let us take a much more high level view. I mean right now we are no longer in the 50s when the early machines came and you had to program in machine language or assembly language. So, we will just look upon a programming language as just a notation for describing algorithms and data and we could look at a program as just a sentence in this language, right. I mean this so, it is it is a language like any other language 
and it has certain rules and you have certain what, what might be called well formed sentences and uh, a program is just some sentence of a programming language. A program is not necessarily an algorithm, uh, well simply because I mean you might have a well formed sentence which is, which is not very meaningful. Okay, for example, it could the program could be a non terminating program in which case uh, it is no longer an algorithm. Okay. Um, and um, so, um, the important thing to realize is that an algorithm is a very abstract object, it does not have any concrete uh, form. What is concrete is whatever is put down as a program. So, the, so the only concrete object that you can have is a program and so the notion of an algorithm itself is an abstract or object uh, is, is an abstract entity which requires a concrete representation in the form of a program. And if a program is a sentence in the programming language then what you require really is a, pro is, is a programming language. And another, another alternative way of looking at the notion of a program vis-a-vis -a, -vis a programming language is uh, as we might think of a program as a specification of a computation. We might think of a program as a specification of a computation which means we have some notion of uh, what constitutes a primitive step of the computation and the program gives you a finite representation of possibly an infinite sequence of steps in a computation process. Yeah. So, the emphasis in all these cases is in the nature of a finitary specification. Okay. I mean you should have a program is should be a finite object by itself. Uh, a programming language itself is not a finite object because there are an infinite number of programs that are possible. But each program itself is a finite object because it is just a sentence of the programming language. Yeah. And then we might think of a programming language if you look upon a computation and the steps in a computation as the most basic feature, then you might think of a programming language just as some notation for writing programs. And in all this case we should emphasize the fact that this notation is important because we are our notation is to give you a finite ray specification of possibly an infinite object right so we might emphasize that this is actually a finite ray specification yeah and these programs themselves as concrete objects are finite ray, but their effects could be infinite Right. So, so it the moment you are trying to represent any infinitary object in a finite manner, you require some you and it has to be machine understandable, you require certain rules. Okay. So, um, well, so let us so let us look at so let us look at this process of uh, of essentially giving a finitary representation to what you might consider infinitary objects. Okay. So, what kinds of infinitary objects are we normally concerned with? Well, in the most general case an algorithm is what you want to represent in a program and an algorithm really in the most general case is a function from some domain to some code domain. And a function need not necessarily be finitary because the domain could be infinite, the codomain could be infinite <coughs> and so we might think of an algorithm in general as computing either a function or a relation, a method for computing some mathematical function or relation and these functions and relations could be infinitary. Yeah. So, 
and so so let's look, so we are looking at infinitary objects basically mathematical functions relations can also be considered functions okay all relations could be considered functions so in general we will concentrate on trying to get finitary representations of infinitary objects and these infinitary objects are really functions so so you, you can think of the whole study of programming or computation as <coughs> trying to compute or trying to give finite specifications of computational steps of abstract mathematical functions yeah so so however when you look at uh, so so uh, so if you look at the mathematics itself it has a fairly rigorous notation so you could think of mathematics itself as a sort of a programming language except that it has one important drawback that is that it does not specify what are the primitive computation that are possible within the mathematical language okay so when you normally ex when you when you are talking about an algorithm to compute some function what you have implicitly defined is a set of primitive functions or primitive computation steps in terms of which you are going to express this algorithm okay so one obvious uh, case in which a lot of mathematics is not it does not fit into the fit into the general framework of a programming language is this uh, for example the representation of infinite sets okay so if you look at i mean whatever you must have studied in school and so on if you look at infinite sets uh, well the standard thing in school is to say that you can either represent a set in roster form or in set builder form is that yeah so a roster form just means enumerating a list of elements and a set builder form essentially means uh, giving an abstract giving a predicate which the elements of the set should satisfy okay so the main difference between the roster form and the set builder form uh, the, the, the 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 set builder form is also called uh, definition by abstraction okay so the main difference between the two really comes up for infinite sets so in the case of infinite sets what you normally do is uh, so supposing you want to specify the set of even numbers so you open braces you write maybe 0 or if you do not include 0 then you write 2 comma 4 comma 6 comma and then dot 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 I mean that is so that is where the inadequacy of mathematical notation comes okay simply because you are not interested really in any underlying computation process as far as mathematics is concerned a large part of it is just the existence is more important than uh, than a computational method okay uh, and uh, whereas the the, the set builder notation or the definition by abstraction gives you a finitary specification so you can represent the set of even numbers through a notation which consists of a braces which consists of a bound variable okay a, a definition a bound variable and a predicate in terms of the bound variable okay. so uh, so a, a typical definition of let us say even numbers would 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 look something like this you would say it is 2x where uh, x let us say belongs to the natural numbers right so here uh, if you if you look at x x is like a locally declared variable okay in fact this is a sort of declaration of x and this 2x is a 
property that the elements of the set should satisfy. Now, here is a case of a finitary specification as opposed to this infinitary specification, right. Yeah. In fact, this is a finitary specification in more ways than one. Firstly, this represents a logical predicate expressed in first order logic in a finite sentence of the first order logic. Okay. And uh, this, so you might consider this as a succinct finitary specification of essentially an infinitary object, the even numbers. Whereas this is really open to many, uh, this, this is really ambiguous in the sense that it is not at all clear from this enumeration what should be the next one. I mean you are using, you are implicitly using human intelligence and human understanding to uh, or, or, or uh, the human uh, the human ability to perform induction to claim that the next number would be 8, but I am not at all sure that the next number should be 8, there might be other patterns for example, okay, it might satisfy other predicates. Whereas this is what one might call an accurate succinct finitary representation using just the language of first order logic built up on a single predicate, a single binary predicate on sets, right. The, this, the, the binary predicate is this belongs to, yeah, okay. <coughs> so, so a lot of, uh, so what uh, a lot of what we are going to do is also going to be related to the language of logic in some ways you will see the analogies between programming languages and logic as we go along. The main motivations of logic well, are, are really of uh, a slightly more abstract nature, but programming languages derive mainly from logic, yeah? in the sense that a language like first order logic does not allow you the freedom to write these dots, I mean there is no such thing. Okay. You have a method of construction of predicates which is always finitary. You have rules of inference in logic which are always finitary or they might be infinitary like if you have axiom schemas, if you have rules like modus ponens, they are finitary representations again of infinitary objects. Okay. Further, in a logical language with, with axioms and rules of inference, there is implicitly understood that those rules and axioms of, uh, those axioms and rules of inference are such that there exists an algorithm which given any instance of the hypothesis of these rules should be able to tell you whether the conclusion of the rule is a valid inference. Yeah? So, if you were to take a simple logical rule like uh, let us take mode exponents, what you have is, I uh, will uh, write this. Uh, so, you have a predicate x, you have a predicate x arrow y and you have y. Okay. So, this x and y are so, this rule actually specifies a three tube, uh, uh, a pair of this form, right.
where x and y are belong to uh, I do not know let us say the language of first order logic which I will write L 1 uh, as opposed to proposition logic which I will write L naught. Okay. So, L 1 is let us say first order logic. So, what you are saying is you take two sentences of first order logic and if they have this pattern that call one sentence x and the other sentence has the pattern x conditional y, then you are able to infer y and you cannot have all rules of inference in logic are finitary. They are also finitary specifications. Yeah? And something that is absolutely essential is that it is decidable by an algorithm whether a certain step in the proof of a logical statement was derived by an application of a rule of inference on some preceding steps. Okay? So, which means that if you claim that you have some predicates, uh, 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 you, you have some predicates of the form uh, let us say A arrow, B arrow <coughs> not C where let me put brackets here and you have something like A arrow B and then you derive from this from these premises if you were to claim that by the use of modus ponens you are you can infer not C, then there has to be an algorithm which given these two as input will be able to tell you whether this is an instance of an application of this rule of inference. Okay? In this case, the algorithm should actually tell you that it, it is not an application of this rule of inference. Okay? In other case, so it should be able to give you both yes and no answers in finite time. Okay? So, all most programming languages that we will study will have will have a lot of their motivations actually derived from logic. A large part of logic was actually concerned with the notion of how much of mathematics is actually doable by a machine. How many what kinds of proofs in what kinds of theorems in mathematics can be actually proved by algorithms by a machine whose basic primitive uh, by machines whose uh, primitive operations are that they are able to do pattern matching and substitution. Okay? So, this is an instance of doing pattern matching and substitution. An inference rule is really an infinite object, it is a relation of this kind with a finite representation. A proof is a finite object, a theorem is a finite, a theorem itself is a finite, is a sentence of a logical language and is a finite object representing possibly an infinite number of instances. Okay? So, the finitary nature of all these will actually influence the nature of a logic. So, for example, you cannot give axioms and rules of inference which are infinitary in a logical language. Okay? So, uh, so, everything should everything that is infinitary should have a finite representation. There are of course, infinitary objects which will have no finite representation. They are clearly not going to be part of our computational process. Okay? So, for example, generating an, uh, an infinite sequence of random numbers. I am by random numbers I do not mean pseudo random numbers I mean pure random numbers is well it is not a computational process period. We are so we are interested in those kinds of infinitary objects which somehow have finite representations. Yeah? So, like maybe infinite sets represented as predicates uh, unary, binary, ternary, but some finitary 
with a finitary representation. We are interested in infinitary computational processes which have finitary representations. We are interested in programming languages which allow for finitary representations of inherently infinite objects, infinitary objects. Yeah. So, uh, so, so let us let us go ahead with uh, I mean th th this, this much of philosophy is perhaps sufficient for the moment, but uh, it is important to realize that right from 1900 when uh, the mathematician David Hilbert posed this problem to the Congress of Mathematics, the main emphasis of logicians and computer scientists has or rather computer scientists came very late in the game, but logicians mainly has been to try to find to define the notion of an algorithm, to define the notion of a computational process, to be able to exactly define what is possible by a computational process, what is not possible by a computational process. Everything that is possible by a computational process should have a finite representation and anything that is infinitary is not part of the computational process <coughs> with some restrictions. Yeah? So, so if you so if you just come down from logic a bit, then what we are looking at, then you so we can look at a logical language itself <coughs> as a mathematical object. For example, there there exist only a finite number of rules for generating an infinite number of sentences of that language. Okay. So, you take, take a language like first order logic, you have only a finite set of formation rules which allow you to generate an infinite number of logical sentences. Okay. Not a, and that the finitely nature of the rules also gives you an algorithm to check given a string of symbols whether this whether this string of symbols is a syntactically valid sentence of the logical language yeah so an important element of that logical language is that the generation process should be finite should be finitary there should be only a finite set of rules and there should be an algorithm which will check which can give you which can, which can clearly tell you whether a given sentence is a well formed sentence of the language right and if you look at propositional logic it 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 does not allow you to specify for example uh, infinitary objects like for which you require, I mean, uh, like, uh, I mean, if you were to actually apply uh, propositional logic to some some area of mathematics, like set theory or number theory, what what you see is that it allows you, uh, it does not allow you to specify infinite sets easily, okay, or certain properties of infinite sets. So very often, so an extension of propositional logic which allows you to do this in a finitary way is the use of quantifiers and the extension of propositional logic to first order logic. Okay. So, you can for example, specify the whole of set theory in first order logic, I mean the axioms of set theory, the, the, uh, the predicates that are valid for all possible sets which do not, I mean by set theory, I mean uh, axiomatic set theory in the sense that we do not assume numbers or we do not assume any predefined set of objects. The only notion is the notion of a set. Okay. So, you generate all sets, you generate numbers, everything from the notion of an empty set and a single predic binary predicate called belongs to. Yeah. So, and they have these formation rules and so on and so forth. Uh, so, anyway, so we are interested essentially in capturing infinitary processes within finitary languages. Yeah? So, 
so we might so let us so and uh, the main way the main so the main difference between uh, so you can see a progression of ideas firstly there is pure mathematics which is platonic in nature in the sense that the notion of a computation itself is not important it is not an important element of the formal discipline of mathematics. Then you have logic which actually gives you um, a loose notion of what is possible by a machine and what is not possible and allows you to specify infinitary objects uh, in some finitary ways. And lastly we have programming languages which specify to a, with a great deal of accuracy exactly the primitive computational processes that you are allowed to use. Okay. And so a programming language is also, also has to satisfy all the constraints of the, of a logical language and in addition it should be consistent with what might be called the primitive computational processes. Okay. For example, one primitive computational process that you must have all studied in school is that of ruler and compass constructions. Yeah? Ruler and compass constructions. Okay. Yeah. So, one, so, so, so there, there are only two computational, primitive computational steps. You are able to uh, draw lines with a ruler, mark off segments you are able to use a compass to draw certain angles or to draw arbitrary angles. Okay. So, one impossible computation in this case is, is there an algorithm using only these primitive concepts to trisect an arbitrary angle. Okay. For example, you are not allowed the use of protractors and so on, you are not allowed to measure the angle. You can only prove that an angle is of a certain measure. For example, if you draw a line perpendicular to another line uh, by with a with a construction proof which shows that it is perpendicular and then you bisect that, then you can claim that that the bisected angle is let us say 45 degrees. But given just an arbitrary angle, two rays from a point. Uh, to be able to trisect it with just these primitive tools for example is an impossible uh, task. Okay. So you might think of the algorithms of ruler and compass constructions, uh, very, I mean the, the algorithms are I mean it is not, it is a programming language with in which uh, you know you have only these two computational processes if you like. It is not, it is not machine readable, it is meant to be human readable. So, well, so you write it in a loose fashion, but essentially you use only those computations which are possible within the domain of Euclidean geometry, which means you are not allowed to measure out angles yourself, you are only allowed to prove that a certain angle has a certain measure. You are not allowed to measure out lengths in terms of centimeters or uh, meters or whatever, you are only allowed to measure out an arbitrary unit and take multiples of that arbitrary unit. You could bisect that arbitrary unit, you could trisect that arbitrary unit of length measure okay. and so therefore claim that it is uh, that, that, that it is actually one third of the unit that you took. But for example, you cannot claim that you have constructed 1 by pi of a unit of length unless you can prove that just by this process you are going to get something that is 1 by pi of the unit. Yeah? Anyway, so, um, so let us, so, so let us, so our programming language has ingrained in it a, the normal computation processes that we associate with a digital computer. I mean that is not, that is not the last word. I mean you could have other computational processes such as ruler and compass constructions, uh, you could have analog computers and so on and so forth, but we are interested, <coughs> excuse me, we are interested primarily in the computation processes associated with uh, digital computers. Yeah? 
So, what we have are so our so uh, as I said we could uh, we could look at uh, the uh, we could look at even the machine language as a programming language, but we are not really interested in a machine language because it has it is a very simple sort of a language very difficult to get any program right I agree, but it is the language itself is a very simple language okay, and probably that is why it makes it so difficult to program. And uh, what we are interested in primarily are what are known as high level languages where you where the primitives of the computation process of the, uh, the primitives of computation or what you might say is the the machine that is made available. So, once you have imp implemented a language on a machine you could think of that machine you could think of that as a machine of that language. So, supposing you have implemented so you most of you have done some programming in Pascal. So, at that point when you are doing Pascal programming you 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 are not really worried about the underlying machine language the underlying architecture you are not worried about anything as far as you are concerned what you have is a Pascal machine. Okay. So, there is a level of abstraction at which you can consider that you have built. Uh, so, to you it makes really no difference whether that Pascal machine whether Pascal is the hardware machine language of that machine or is it or it is just some software language as far as you are concerned it is a Pascal machine. Okay. So, it is important to realize that you, you can actually take some bare machine and cover it up with layers and layers of software and think of just one abstract machine which gives you certain capabilities. So, so, if you look at the if you look at the bare machine it gives you only the capabilities to manipulate switches to write programs in binary and so on. If you look at a Pascal machine it gives you gives you no it gives you no extra computational power, but it gives you the ability to look upon the whole thing as a single machine which allows let us say construction of complicated structured programs it allows various kinds of abstraction mechanisms procedures functions and, uh, and it allows you to uh, do uh, express uh, in terms uh, I mean it uh, it allows you to express things differently okay from what the bare machine would have given you right so so let us look at uh, why we should study programming languages because all the time we are looking at the construction of some virtual machine and uh, what facilities we are not really interested in the facilities that the machine gives us we are interested in um, we are interested in various uh, in what kinds of features are there in that machine. In the, in the case of a bare machine you are interested in its architecture. Now, if you have a Pascal machine its architecture is really the features of Pascal. Okay. If you have a Lisp machine its architecture is really the features of Lisp. Right. So, we will so our study of programming languages is mainly to for example, you want to understand why certain features have been included in the programming language. You want to understand for example, how best those features could be used. Okay. You this and if you you also want to understand how that language is implemented okay. so that presumably you would be able to with all this understanding presumably you would be able to learn new languages easily maybe you can design new languages that is more important and uh, perhaps you would also be able to if you understand the underlying implementations maybe you would be able to incorporate new features in a programming language. 
Yeah. So, uh, so let's just look at languages. We we'll, let's sort of classify what kinds of languages there are. Firstly, we have these low-level and low-level languages, which are machine and assembly language, which are not interest, which are not are of interest. I mean, you will learn about them in some course on architecture or organization. But what we are interested primarily are these high-level languages. Okay of which you can we can think of three broad classifications one is a class of imperative languages in which most of our most of the last 40 years has gone in uh, since the first digital computers has gone in the design of imperative languages then there are what are known as functional or applicative languages and then it's possible to use logic itself as a programming language And then what you can do is you can actually mix up all these things and for example, you can have impure functional languages. Okay. Uh, so, uh, an imperative language means that uh, it, it uses the notion of a command, it uses the notion of a state to change a state. So, the commands change states, that is what an imperative language would be. Okay. So, uh, a functional language is one which allows you to program in something that is as close to uh, mathematics as possible. You know? okay, we will we'll get into these notions uh, a, uh, a bit more in detail later. Okay, so so, a broad classification of languages is just in terms of high level languages, imperative, functional, logic. Um, you could also classify languages by features and uh, by features in the sense that what is the most uh, glaring feature in the language. Well, so a large part of our languages are really what are what might be called sequential languages. So, most of the languages that you are programmed in are really sequential languages. Then you have what are these parallel languages which are very often languages meant for certain specialized architectures like uh, um, you like you have a single instruction, multiple data and you execute things in parallel. I mean there is an there are implicit methods to uh, do things in a parallel fashion. You have what are known as distributed languages in which they are not, so in the, in the case of a parallel language you assume that there is, a, uh, you assume that there are so many processors which will, which will all execute the same instructions in a synchronous lockstep fashion. Okay? So, most of the vector processors actually have uh, sequential languages vectorized or made parallel like in the case of Fortran 90 or vector processing Fortran and so on and so forth. Yeah? Distributed languages are those in which uh, you actually assume that the different units of a program are going to lie geographically distributed across let us say a network and they have to somehow cooperate to achieve maybe some common task, right. Then you have these, uh, so in both these cases in both in we might we might loosely assume in both the in, the, in both parallel and distributed languages that the notion of a process a com of a computational process into which a program is split is inherently or intimately related to really the computational power to the number of units of computation that number of units of um, let us say CPUs that you have. I mean, so the notion of a process and a processor are really the same. I mean, you are writing, you are writing one process per processor in both these cases maybe. Yeah. In the case of concurrent languages, what you are, you are basically taking the notion of a process to be a loose entity completely different from, it does not necessarily have to be mapped on to the existing processors. 
the notion of a process gets delinked from the notion of a processor. Then you have other kinds of languages, those whose primary feature is that of modules, separate comp compilation and more recently you have what, what might be called object oriented languages. In these, these add extra features on top of existing languages usually, but there is something fundamental about the new feature that they introduce. So, uh, so when we look at, uh, so let us, so let us just, let us just quickly go through for example, some of these languages. So, you would, so if you were to take the history of programming languages, you would find that there is a certain chronological dependence, right. So, the first high level languages so to speak were Fortran which is mainly meant for scientific computation and then COBOL which is meant for business. It was more verbose, it actually used full English sentences to represent computations. It made the first division, distinction between data and program uh, and was meant to use a large amount of data and do very low processing, I mean it was IO bound programs, whereas Fortran was uh, meant for minimal IO and maximal computation, yeah. And uh, these languages gave rise to one important class of languages called the Algol like languages, which came from the report, from, from the Algol 60 report. Fortran also had its offshoots in basic. Then there were these, among the Algol like languages, among the Algol like languages you have Pascal, PL1, similar. PL1 was, a, was an attempt at a unified language for both scientific and business commercial processing. And uh, from Pascal you get extra features in something like Modula and Ada. From similar you got these object oriented languages starting from small talk 80, okay. And all these and uh, somewhere in a parallel stream which is marked by this orange you have BCPL and C. Actually BCPL went was a was a transformation of a language called B which itself was a transformation of a language called A and uh, the C was derived from BCPL by modification, yeah. And then once small talk 80 came up and C was there and object orientedness became a big buzzword, you had C++, yeah, which I, which is not here, okay. So, um, so, uh, so that is briefly what uh, we are, uh, you might say our pedigree of languages is mainly, oh, we also have these functional languages, right. I mean, so, let us, let us look at functional languages. Uh, so, you have in in a in a, apart from these imperative languages you had basically the first functional language was lisp from which were derived various s versions uh, maclisp scheme common lisp uh, maclisp can maclisp and common lisp are really impure versions of lisp when we understand functionality i'll we'll come to what they what they mean impure versions but uh, many of you have probably studied scheme Okay, it is a cleaned up version of Lisp and uh, there was in parallel with Lisp which is meant for Lisp processing, there was also a language designed in, in the 60s called Snowball which was meant for string processing which allowed efficient pattern matching constructs to be programmed. And these have actually yielded along with the emphasis on type checking. To a, to a language called ML which came up in the 80s and actually all these languages Lisp and ML were all inspired by the what is known as the lambda calculus which we will study which is the basis of all functional languages, okay. <clears throat>